OK, hello, everyone. Uh, I will talk today about um, proof of stake sidechains. So this is collaborative work with my colleagues Peter Gaggi and Agilos Keyas. So let me start with describing the problem we're trying to solve. So um, we're trying to solve this problem for, uh, in particular, proof of stake blockchains. So, so I will focus on this topic in this work. And this will be based on the um, formalization we have for proof of stake blockchains uh, called Uravoros. So this is a protocol that is pre-existing, and it's a provably secure proof of stake protocol. Um, so the problem we're trying to solve here is um, the following. Currently, when people use Bitcoin and Ethereum, they use Bitcoin for a specific reason, and they use Ethereum for a different reason. They use Bitcoin for its safety and relative stability and low volatility compared to, let's say, Ethereum. On the other hand, they would use Ethereum to, um, to have a feature completeness, Turing completeness, and the nice features of smart contracts. So we see here there's two different blockchains that give different features. And um, they cannot necessarily be easily combined. Um, in particular, the safety of Bitcoin comes exactly from the fact that uh, its code base is limited and they don't accept too many feature-rich uh, feature requests. So um, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to create a cryptocurrency in which you will have multiple blockchains and we would like these blockchains to be able to communicate with one another and exchange information and value. And this is useful because if you have two blockchains, you can have different features on each of them. Um, we start with this blockchain here, which I will call SL for settlement layer. And this will play the role of um, Bitcoin in the current cryptocurrency world. Um, so it has the Genesis block and a few other blocks, and there's some transactions going on there. Um, and we intend this to be a um, limited feature blockchain. So not, not to have many abilities other than moving money around. And um, we hope people will use this as a savings blockchain, where they keep their money safe, but they don't have all the nice features of a smart contract blockchain, let's say. And then we plan to create a network of blockchains. I will just show the case of making two blockchains here. Um, this naturally extends to having multiple blockchains. So uh, we start by introducing a second blockchain, the computation layer. And that's a separate blockchain with a separate Genesis block. And um, it evolves independently of the settlement layer. And in the computation layer, we want to have um, feature-rich smart contracts. So the problem we're trying to solve here is how do you move money from the settlement layer to the computation layer? And then how do you move it back? So we want these two chains to work with one shared cryptocurrency and the users to be able to hold the money wherever they need it to be, either for saving or for useful features. So you can think of the settlement layer as a savings account and the computation layer as a, um, as a checkings account where you can move your money around more, more easily and with more features. Right, so what we want to achieve here, and this is our contribution with this, is um, when you um, have some money in the settlement layer, you do a transaction here in the settlement layer, and that transaction destroys a coin here in the settlement layer, and then a new coin appears in the computation layer. Then you can move that coin around in the computation layer, and then whenever you want, you can do another transaction over here, destroy the coin in the computation layer, do a transaction to do that, and then a new coin appears in the settlement layer. So with these destruction and creation transactions, you're essentially able to move assets from one chain to another, like that. And of course, um, this coin here can change hands, maybe be split up or merged into, um, you, you can split up a coin into its denominations and only move part of it back and so on. Right, so um, if you already have a settlement layer um, blockchain, uh, the computational layer can start later on. So it can have a genesis block that uh, starts later on. And this is what we propose in this paper. If you have an existing blockchain, you can do it, uh, you can create a new blockchain that will function as a computational layer later on. Now, the system that um, I'm discussing here is not applicable to known blockchains such as Bitcoin and Ethereum because they're proof of work blockchains. This works for proof of stake. Um, but what we're doing is applicable to the Cardano blockchain and we're doing uh, an implementation there. So this is our, um, our uh, application for this. Right, so what we propose here is to have two types of nodes. Uh, the first kind of node is a settlement layer node and this is um, a node that only looks at the settlement layer. 
And then you have a different type of node, a second type of node, which is called the uh, SCL node, a settlement and computational layer node. And these nodes monitor both these blockchains. So if somebody is interested in running um, on the computational layer, they can look at both blockchains. They can, their node can connect to both. But if they're just settlement layer nodes, their code is really simple. It only looks at the settlement layer blockchain. Now, the, the, the challenge with this is how do we move money in and out when these miners don't necessarily look at both blockchains? Well, moving money out of the, um, of the settlement layer and into the computation layer is the easy part. Um, you do a rate, so this is the life cycle of money basically. It starts by living in the settlement layer and the settlement layer is also where the macroeconomic policy of the currency is applied. It's where new coins are minted and so on. And it moves around there. At some point there's a special transaction that destroys the money and that's confirmed in the settlement layer. And then a follow-up transaction creates corresponding money in the computation layer. Um, when we move money back in from the computational layer into the settlement layer, this is the harder part. And again, you have the same life cycle. You have some money that lives in the computational layer. It was moved there previously. And then there's a special transaction that destroys this money in the computational layer and a follow-up transaction within the settlement layer that creates um, the corresponding new money. The challenge is validating this creation transaction in each case to ensure that the respective amount has been destroyed in the remote blockchain. So this is how it looks. Um, and here's why it's easy to do the one-way thing. And this is one type of node that we propose. It's called a direct observation method. So if you have a, an SCL node that monitors both, both blockchains, it's easy for them to verify that this money creation transaction is actually valid. And the reason is because, because they monitor both these blockchains, they can wait for confirmation on the top blockchain um, for the money destruction transaction. They wait a couple of blocks for the transaction to be confirmed. And after that is happening, uh, that has happened, then they can verify the money creation transaction at the bottom. Because they connect to both these networks and they monitor both blockchains by direct observation, this is basically trivial. The difficult problem is moving money back because uh, the settlement layer nodes, the SL nodes, even though we want them to validate all the transactions that get confirmed within the settlement layer, they are not looking at blocks in the computation layer. They don't, they don't look at all the transactions over there. And we don't want to send them all the transactions of the computation layer or all the blocks of the computation layer. So the, this is the isolation challenge. We want the settlement layer miners to learn about some information that happens on the computation layer but without, um, without actually connecting to it. Um, and of course, we cannot just send them the transaction because they need to know whether that transaction has been confirmed on the computation layer. They need to deal with blockchain reorgs and so on and so forth. So in order to solve this problem, what we do is we synchronize the epochs of these two chains. And um, I, um, I should remind you in the Ouroboros blockchain in the proof of work, um, e the epochs are, um, periods of time where you have uh, blocks and the, the, there's slots of time where in each slot there is a, an elected leader which is responsible for creating a block. So um, the leader election happens at the beginning of every epoch and then the leaders are elected for the rest of the epoch and then at the end of the epoch there's a new election process that takes place. So given this, uh, we uh, synchronize these, uh, uh, these periods, these epochs between the two layers and once we've done that, here's the, the um, insight for this solution. So in, this, in the computation layer, um, the computation layer during, the, um, during, the, during each epoch, they elect a small committee of people which will be responsible for passing data to the settlement layer. And they will do that by signing off a certificate that says, here's what happened to the computation layer. But what we want is this committee, we don't want this to be a federation, we don't want this to be centralized. We want this to be representative of the underlying uh, stake. So based on the idea that the majority of stake is honest in the epoch, which is an assumption that the Ouroboros paper uh, makes, the committee that is elected here, we want, we want it to preserve this honest majority. Uh, so this means that we will not introduce any additional security assumptions uh, compared to what the Bear protocol uh, has with one blockchain. 
Now, in order to do the election, what we do is we take the last two k slots of the epoch, where this k is the common prefix parameter of the uh, backbone work and the Ouroboros work. It's the number of blocks you need to wait for confirmation. Um, and then we take the last two k slots of each epoch, and within there we find who are the elected who are the elected leaders of that. And those are the people, the 2K people, which will be responsible for forming this committee. And for large enough uh, K, the probability that uh, the majority of um, people within this committee will be uh, adversarial is negligible, provided that we have honest majority in the underlying stake. So this, this committee, it's important to know that it's not a federation because it changes for, from epoch to epoch. It's a different committee from epoch to epoch. Okay, so we take the last 2K, 2K slots, and these are the people that will, um, will be signing off um, these sort of transfers from the computation layer back to the settlement layer. So here's what happens. Uh, you have three epochs here, epoch seven, eight, and nine. At epoch eight, we have some transactions that uh, happened, and these transactions are collected into a, a compact Merkle tree, and then that Merkle tree is uh, signed off by the a committee which was elected for epoch eight. So there is two case signatures um, in the optimistic case, or if there are some malicious people that are not willing to do the signature, there's uh, K plus one signatures. And the majority of them will, will sign, the majority of the stake here will sign um, for the fact that this money is moving away. And this certificate is then posted on the settlement layer blockchain. And um, in our paper, we have an interesting construction where these um, K plus one or two K uh, signatures can be nicely aggregated into a very short signature. And then on the other side, the signature verification is a simple signature verification. It's a, it's a protocol that looks exactly like standard uh, signature verification. So you can do that. Um, now the question is, how does the settlement layer know who is the correct committee? Because the, com the um, stake on the computation layer evolves uh, with time and the, the settlement layer uh, miners do not know how this evolution has taken place. Um, in order to do that, when the computation layer is first created during its genesis block, it has a certain stake distribution. Now that stake distribution is known to the um, settlement layer miners. So that's the base of the induction. And then as the epochs evolve, the elected committee that uh, voted for which transactions took place on the computational layer also votes on a different statement that says what is the new committee on the computational layer. So the previous committee of the previous epoch in the computational layer, they sign a certificate that says these are the transactions that took place and this is the new committee for the new epoch. And they make this certificate um, statement, they, they, they post it on the settlement layer once every epoch. Um, now, one very interesting property that we are, were able to prove in this paper is the firewall property. And this was um, one of the original goals of sidechains um, from the time they were first envisioned. Um, and this is the firewall property. And the idea is if in the computational layer you have some sort of catastrophic failure, um, for example, there is a catastrophic bug which allows arbitrary money creation, the settlement layer is protected. And this is how we ensure the safety of the settlement layer. Um, the way we do that is quite simple, really. Um, when you have an incoming transaction, an in incoming transfer into the settlement layer, the settlement layer node verifies that the total amount that went out of the settlement layer and into the computational layer must be more than what came back in. So you cannot bring more money in from the computational layer into the settlement layer than what went out. Um, the, the challenge here technically is to, to be able to prove this. And in order to do that, uh, what we do is we introduce a... Um, an interesting definition of what it means for a sidechain to be secure. Um, and I have it as, a, as an extra slide here at the end. So uh, I, I'm not gonna read that, but uh, I invite you to um, go to our paper and read this definition. I think it's very interesting because we, um, this is something that we recommend that researchers adopt when they want to prove cross-chain uh, tran transfer security. Um, so we have um, very interesting formalism and um, mathematics going on here. And, um, I would be very happy to see that being adopted in other papers. I think it's a, a very useful formalism. And with that, um, I, I would like to show you uh, some more papers other than our 
uh, currently presented paper here. Uh, the rest of the papers that I have here, um, there's one that was presented in FC earlier this year uh, and uh, a few others from our group. And these show how to do the same thing with proof of work. So actually with, uh, with this we complete uh, the schema for proof of stake and now we can do these things for proof of work and proof of stake. And in fact, um, the scheme that I showed you today, I showed it to you in terms of creating a new blockchain that, um, that does this. But in fact, it's possible to retrofit existing blockchains, both in proof of stake and proof of work, to have these kind of features. So to create a new chain that is able to communicate, as well as to build communication between two existing blockchains. So no child parent relationship between the blockchains, but two existing blockchains. For example, uh, we could interconnect Cardano, a proof of stake blockchain, with Ethereum, a proof of work blockchain, both of which are currently standalone and they don't have this feature built in. So we can retrofit it um, later on. So this is described in this series of works. And uh, with that, I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Questions, yes. Hi, Luke Desitels from Samsung Research America. My question is a little out of scope, so it's okay if you'd like to discuss offline instead. Okay. Uh, I'm very curious about sidechains and their implications for taxes. Um, I think trying to explain your taxes where you convert from, it's essentially sometimes the same cryptocurrency, they're one-to-one -one ratios, but sometimes they're not, as you described, like combining proof of stake and proof of, uh, proof of work blockchains together. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the tax implications of needing to convert between different tokens yeah. very rapidly often? Okay, so in, in this construction, the cryptocurrency remains the same between two different blockchains. So that's, a, that's a very interesting property. If you have a chain that lives on one blockchain, uh, if you have an asset that lives on one blockchain and you move it with this mechanism to another, it retains its nature. So basically this allows us to separate the notion of a blockchain from the notion of a cryptocurrency and have multiple blockchains hold the same cryptocurrency. For example, using this method, you would be able to move, for instance, an Ethereum token from the Ethereum blockchain into the Cardano blockchain and it would retain its nature. So for tax purposes, you could probably argue that this is the same token. Yeah, it's still on Ethereum, even though it lives on a different blockchain. Yeah. So when the committee signs off on the destruction of a coin or a new committee, are they providing some sort of uh, Byzantine consensus, or is it weaker than that? So because the committee, so this is an inductive argument. If the committee of Epoch J is honest, then they will sign the committee of Epoch J plus one. By assumption that they're honest in Epoch J, they will provide a truthful signature and then that passes control to Epoch J plus one, and then the Epoch J committee is no longer valid, and the Epoch J plus one committee is now valid. Uh, the only assumption we make for that is that there is honest majority in the underlying stake. Uh, the way that we do the election, we choose 2K people that are uh, an unbiased sample of the underlying stake, so uh, we can conclude from that that um, the K plus one of the committee, of the 2K people, will be honest. And there's a proof of that in our paper. We have time for one more question. Yes. Hi. Um, isn't the security of the base settlement layer reliant on your top layers now? If the adversary breaks into one of the top layers somehow in one of the committees in one particular epoch, and he manages to send some transactions to the settlement layer, uh, doesn't this essentially corrupt the base settlement layer? In other words, this is like a single point of failure for, our, for your whole side chains. Yeah, um, so this is exactly the firewall property that we have. If there is some corruption in the computation layer, the only thing that can be affected are accounts within the computation layer. The settlement layer macroeconomic policy and accounts cannot be affected. And the reason that we're able to achieve that is exactly because the settlement layer miners, they verify that the amount that comes in is no more than what went out. So computational layer people can potentially lose their money if there's a bug in the computation layer. But if there's a bug in the computation layer, the settlement uh, layer cannot um, have more money imported in than one went out. And so its value will be retained. So thank you very much. Thank you.